I am here with Dr. Sebastian Purcell, Professor of Philosophy, SUNY Cortland. Thank you so much, Dr. Purcell, for joining us. So you're going to tell us all about Aztec philosophy. But before you do that, I'm just curious, who exactly are the Aztecs? All right. Well, thanks for having me here, Sahar. Um, yeah. So the Aztecs, the people that we call the Aztecs, actually never even they didn't really use that name for themselves. We're talking pre-Columbian people living in what we call now Mexico. And uh, they spoke a language, Nahuatl, right? The, yeah. Uh, yeah. So N-A-H-U-A-T-L, actually. The I there would make that into a verb. <laughs> anyway, not wrong. But it, would, it would have an L. Yes, there you go. Now what? And uh, most Americans have a really hard time pronouncing that. So just say like, now what? That's how you pronounce it. That's the language they spoke. And it would make more sense to call them the Nahuas. That would be like calling the Greeks Greek because they spoke Greek or the English English because they spoke English, right? Uh, calling them the Aztecs is a little bit like calling the Greeks the Olympians because they had myths about Olympus, right? The Aztecs had myths about Aztlan, but that's just odd, right? So um, these are the people in central Mexico that spoke Nahuatl, yeah, and, and yeah, the time period we're looking at is right from 1299 to 1521. That's where they are. Um, they had originally come south from what's well, actually the United States now. They immigrated back south there, and they were a group of people who came to slow prominence. And we kind of mark 1299 as the beginning of the people because there was a self-conception around that time. There was an Aztec princess, her name was Shieldflower, uh, and she uh, died kind of heroically after being captured in the memory of her people. And she challenged, she said in her last words that her people would be a great nation. They would all be great warriors and you will always remember us. And those people did go on and slowly become the, the empire that we recognize as the Aztec empire, which is really just three main cities that kind of, it was an alliance among three main powerful cities in that area. One of them was Mexico City. So that's, that's the group of people we're talking about. And yeah, 1521, that's when they kind of, well, okay, that was Cortez, right? So the Spaniards come over, um, they topple things, through a whole series of weird coincidences and a lot of smallpox. And uh, that's kind of how the power transitions at that point. Uh, there is a what might be better called the Spanish-Aztec War. It's not really a conquest. There was a war, it was short, and uh, power transitioned into the hands of the Spaniards. But a lot of the indigenous stuff continued for quite a long period of time. And it's actually in that period of time just afterwards that the friars wrote some stuff down in Nahuatl, the original language, they learned it. So in order to communicate with the indigenous, they became fluent in it. They spoke to the people that they called philosophers and the Spaniards thought that they were philosophers and they wrote it all down. And that's kind of how we have all this stuff. And it's been preserved for roughly, I mean, we're talking 1521. So roughly 500 years, almost exactly. The stuff has been preserved in the original languages and uh, yeah, so that's what we're talking about, the philosophy of these people. So did we rediscover the philosophy that was written down? And, and when, you're, when you're saying written down, do you mean like images? <laughs> yeah, good question. Right. Uh, so we have um, nine, okay-ish, pre-conquest codices that were written down in kind of like ideographic form. So people think of those as hieroglyphics, that's close enough. Um, and hieroglyphics are their own specific thing, ideographic writing is the broad category. And we have nine codices in that tradition that survived the bonfires. Uh, basically, there were different kinds of generations of power among the Spaniards. Some of them were amenable to the indigenous population, other were not one of those groups decided to burn a bunch of stuff. And so we lost a lot of information. Uh, but we got nine of those codices written down in ideographic form. The problem for philosophers is that it's really hard to make sense of them because they don't clearly have propositions, right? Philosophers like propositions. Those are statements that are true or false 
right? And it's from those that we can make arguments and philosophers argue. And so if you don't have true or false statements, philosophers kind of wonder like, well, what am I doing, right? How do I get this off the ground? And those pre-context codices are really hard to look for propositions in that way. So what we actually look at are the volumes and volumes of material that the Spanish friars wrote down in an attempt to understand the indigenous population so that they could convert them. Basically, the problem was is they all came over and the well-intentioned ones thought like, oh, well, they're clearly human. Uh, we'll make them into good Christians. And then they told them, these are the beliefs of the Christians. And the indigenous population said, yeah, nah, that sounds crazy. Just didn't, <laughs> just didn't believe, right? I mean, and you can kind of get it. Like, so they realized they were going to have to pitch the Christian ideas. And in order to make it successful, they would have to understand the population. So Bernie of Sahagun or Bernardino de Sahagun, he um, took 30 years. Okay, so this is a really sort of involved project. He got four children that he was raising in the area, Mexico City area, with all of the friars, and they trained them to be fluent in Spanish. They were obviously Nahua, and uh, they also trained them to be fluent in Latin. So they were trilingual. And he got four of those children. They grew up to age. And then he went around and interviewed all of the philosophers, the Tlamatinime, in the main cities in the area, and kind of cross-checked with all of these scribes. So it was a team. We would now say that Sahagun was the PI of an ethnographic team, right? That's what we would say right now. That's what he did. And they had kind of structured interview questions. And they would interview people and then write down their responses. And they did that for to create kind of an encyclopedia of the Aztec worldview. It comprised 12 volumes, just a massive work, took 30 years to do. And we have it originally recorded in uh, Nahuatl, a Spanish translation by Sahagun himself, and then a pictorial translation because to follow in the old tradition. So they got old uh, uh, scribes to draw in in kind of a modified format, new pictures that would go along and accompany the text. Right. And so that's how we got the general history of the things of New Spain. Um, it's generally called the Florentine Codex, though, because after it was completed, it was impounded by the Spanish royal crown. He had to send a version of it all the way over to Europe. It was then gifted to the Medici family, and so it went to Florence where it stayed in the library and people forgot about it for about 200 years. And then uh, after that point, it was kind of rediscovered in the late 1700s, a German anthropologist whose brother was um, a philosopher, von Humboldt, it was the Wilhelm and Alexander, so Alexander found this, but Wilhelm von Humboldt, who kind of engineered the German university system, kind of gave us our sense of the universities came out of this, okay. So um, his brother went over, was really interested in this stuff, rediscovered it, went to Mexico, had the things unearthed as an anthropologist of various sculptures and everything else. And he became aware of the work and kind of brought it back into scholarly prominence and hit and miss for another 150 years of this sort of thing. 1954, um, let's see here, Miguel Leon Portilla publishes a book, he's a Mexican, anthropologist, but he got his degrees in philosophy in the United States. So undergrad and master's in the US in philosophy, went down to Mexico, finished off his uh, doctoral work working on the Aztecs in this tradition that kind of came from von Humboldt forward, and uh, which is, you know, philosophically inspired. And they recognized that, you know, the Nahuas were philosophers, the Spaniards even noted that they were philosophers at the time. So um, Miguel Luis Portillo writes a book called uh, La Filosofía Nahuatl, so Nahua philosophy, and it falls dead off the press in 1954. It's panned. These barbarians couldn't possibly have a philosophy. It's not well received. And Leon Portia spends the rest of his life pursuing the same project under the title of Nahua literature or Nahua poetry. And that's how it gets accepted. His book is translated into English in an abridged form called Aztec Thought and Culture, 1964. And 
that is kind of where that happened, right? So I knew Leon Portia, he passed in 2019, late 2019, very wonderful man, active to the very end, still answering technical questions about translation and stuff until they're very, very good on email. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's sort of what happened there. Jim Maffey, a friend of mine began, he read Leon Portia's book in the 1990s and thought like, oh, Aztec philosophy is a thing, you know? Um, so I'll start writing on it. Philosophers didn't want to hear about it. Uh, he published all of his works in anthropological journals. As a result, uh, just doesn't really want to deal with philosophers even still. Um, another one of my friends, uh, Alejandro Santana, he he kind of wrote the meta philosophical work that we need to accept that this is philosophy. The problem with the work when it's presented like this is it's not like you can tell like which individual philosopher wrote each piece. Mm. Remember, this is recorded by structured interviews. Right, so it's sort of an aggregated view. Can you have a philosophy without a philosopher? Right, that's sort of one question there. And so Alejandro worked that out uh, and a number of other things that, uh, you know, this is written down in Latin letters, but that's not in digit, it's like it's written. So it looks like ordinary writing to us, but um, it's not the writing system that they used. It still counts, he makes that argument, you know, that sort of stuff. And so they kind of, paved the way in 2016, I finally completed a piece on the Aztec ethical views. And I got the APA's award, the American Philosophical Association Award for best essay in 2017, right, uh, for that piece. And so that's kind of, that marks the, the official acceptance of the APA that Aztec philosophy is real and it's a thing. So that's kind of where we are with it. I stumbled into it by accident. I was looking at stuff at like a library. I was preparing for another class over summer. I was in grad school at the time. Uh, I found Miguel Leon Portilla's book, La Filosofía de Nahuatl, and uh, I got lost in that for a week. I, I am half Mexican. My, fa my fa family's in Mexico. And I was just blown away by the idea that the indigenous culture had a philosophy. It derailed me for a week. I had to read the whole book. I then decided to learn Nahuatl because um, it mattered to me, wow. you know, right? And then I decided to write nothing about it until I got tenure <laughs> because I wasn't going to wager my career on the fact that whether or not this is going to be accepted because I knew the history of it. And I was like, no, 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 make tenure first, then go out and do this thing. And so that's kind of how I got into it. Um, but yeah, so it's been this slow recovery process. If I could summarize all of that in a nutshell, it would be something like this. Um, yeah, the philosophy has been around for 500 years. It's just most, mostly been buried under cultural bias. And that did a better job. Like people knew about it, right? They knew it existed. They just refused to recognize it as philosophy. So cultural bias did a better job of burying it, literal physical dirt. We found ruins and pyramids and things like that far faster than we recovered Aztec philosophy, which has just been lying around and no one has been reading it. By the way, uh, I should make a note. Uh, Sahagun's work is not the only one. There are similar other pieces out there. So there's lots of it. Um, we just haven't been paying attention. It's been there the whole time. So there's this, there's this uh, cultural bias mm -hmm. and the bias says something like, the Aztecs build pyramids and they throw people off of it. Uh, I heard about sacrificial stories and now you, you threw in that word that they're barbarians. How could they have a philosophy? And, and there's a lot to be said about this bias, but how much is historically true, the, the sacrifices and, and this kind of sending kids up top of a mountain to see if they live and taking the prettiest woman and ripping her heart out. Right. <laughs> How much of that How much is, of it is true? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think um, the Spaniards were pretty successful at their propaganda campaign. Most Americans, I think, are aware of the fact that propaganda is extremely successful. I think we've had some recent events where we recognize that, yeah, this works. And the Spaniards had a vested interest that if the um, indigenous population could be labeled as barbarian under certain kind of legal forms, then they had uh, 
just cause to wage war against those people and take their land from them now. So that meant that they had to report on them as doing certain things that would qualify them as barbarians. And um, historians have slowly changed this. Matthew Restall has been uh, spearheading the historical change. Basically, uh, they stopped listening to the Spaniards' reports. Like, why read the reports from the Spaniards when they have a vested interest to lie and accept that as true, rather than read the reports from the indigenous population? And so if you look at those reports, you get a vastly different view of what's going on. Um, so here's the thing that I can say. I'll say two things about uh, the human sacrifice thing really briefly, because there's like tons that could be said. Uh, on the historical point, look, if you go to the Templo del Mayor, for example, where supposedly the Spaniards said like 80, on one occasion, 80,000 victims were sacrificed. Okay, so archaeologists did work and they've excavated stuff in all kinds of areas, multiple teams over decades. And we've compiled the list of the total number of people that have like bodies that have been found. And the answer is for a period that would represent more than like maybe, we're talking like 80 years, there are 426 bodies. So that looks, that's just a lot less, right? Um, and Restall's suggestion, and it makes a lot of sense, is that the closer European analog would be public execution. Okay, there's not a right, a, a, an exactly similar idea, but that's the closest idea. And if you compare that uh, public executions, there are a lot more public executions going on in Europe, which, which were far more barbaric in terms of you know, human rights abuses. So um, we'll just leave that part at that. Like It's been greatly exaggerated. They had a vested interest in exaggerating it. The archeological evidence is nowhere close to that. Okay, um, the philosophical point, that matters to me is just, okay, well, does their ethical outlook have um, or entail human sacrifice as like a basic element of it? Like, and, and that's where the real, because that's where the barbarian claim would have any footing. If they could make the case that their ethical outlook entails this kind of like murdering innocent people, then I think you would have grounds for claiming that so-and-so is a barbarian. You know, um, and the answer is just no, flat out, that's, that's not true. And, and people didn't know that because they haven't been considering them as a philosophical culture, <laughs> right? They could have, they could have read the same stuff that I've been reading, um, they just haven't. But when you read that and you realize, no, no, there's a, there's a worldview here and there's just nothing that is ethically basic about this. What really happened is they have a bunch of ethical views and they had bad physical or they had physical principles where they thought they needed to do some things in some ways to keep the universe from collapsing um, and they were wrong about that like most pre-modern views and that's the truth there but it just doesn't that's that's bad physics that's not bad ethics so different things uh, so what is carrying the explanatory load is on that side of things as a philosopher as an ethicist i can then easily jettison that part and just say like, well, but the ethical views are this thing. If you know we don't think the sun is gonna collapse, then uh, we don't have to do those things. So that's how that, that's kind of how that pans out, which and we'll have to talk more about what the ethical views are that we'll, we'll get there. But I, I think that's the short point on that. One, there's a history and two, there's like the ethical analysis and a neither point is the prevailing uh, stereotype right as you would expect. Okay, so let me ask you about Aztec metaphysics. And when we're asking about metaphysics, we're talking about what is real and what exists, the view on the cosmos. So let's let's turn to the Aztec metaphysics. Okay. What can you tell us? So um, there's some interesting things here. So I, I like to use the word metaphysics rather than ontology. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, ontology in, in English comes from the Greek word own, O-N, um, it's a long O in Greek, and in the in other cases, not the primary cases, what are called the oblique cases, it's O-N-T is the stanza, so you get on, on, toss, on, t, on, toss, so those are all versions of it, that's where we get ontology from, that's how you make the longer form of it, uh, that word means being. And 
the thing about Nahuatl is that they don't have a word for being. Yes, the study of being. And they have no word, Nahuatl has no word for being. They have no word for is. It's not even implied in their grammar, right? Uh, it is what's called an omnipredicative language. Everything except from a few particles, which aren't words, is um, a predicate, which is a little bit like saying everything is a verb. So rather than having just a table, for example, you say he, she, or it tables. Everything can be a freestanding sentence. So there are nouns, but they're nouns by analogy to our grammar. They're not really nouns. So, uh, right? So everything in the language flows. Technically, there aren't even words. Everything is a wordle sentence. So it is a very different language, very, very different. And the result of that is that they don't have a word for being and they don't have a word for is, um, we can project that sort of stuff onto that language, but that is our view on them. Viewed internally, it doesn't exist. Okay. So um, yes, hence metaphysics rather than ontology because they don't have a word for being. That's kind of the basic problem then is, okay, so in the Western tradition, we like to say that uh, Willard Van Overquine wrote a very famous essay on what there is. And he says that the um, English language can express the basic problem of ontology in three words. What is there? That's it. That's what they're asking. And he says, moreover, you can answer it in one word. Everything. And everyone will agree. The real question is, what is included in everything? Now, the weird thing for the Nahuas is you can't ask Coyne's question, what is there? It doesn't make sense. It's not expressible in the language. You can paraphrase, right? And they do have a sense of what there is, but it's not going to be similar, okay? Uh, insofar as grammar tends to tilt our thought along a certain direction, the grammar of, Nah of Nahuatl suggests that our world is a kind of flowing state of stuff. Everything flows in a certain way. What there is, is this primal fundamental energy, which they called Ometeot. O-M-E-T-E-O-T-L. Teot, T-E-O-T-L, is, yes, uh, God, uh, divine, uh, nature, just kind of a basic energy of the universe. But that's considered very abstractly. That, that on its own doesn't exist. That has to exist in a concrete form, hence the oma gets added to it. For something to exist in some concrete form, it has to take place by way of a kind of a dualizing relationship. That's how they thought of things. So, you know, um, up, down, here, there, they also included like day, night, nine and 13 for some weird reason. Um, male, female, those sorts of things. The idea is that there are basic relationships um, that structure what there is. And those are relationships. So it's the, you have polar terms, for example, male and female, but they kind of work together as features of energy and there exists a continuum between them. The, we have um, images in the Museo Antropologico in Mexico City, that's the Ant Anthropological Museum. And where they, they have these little images that have uh, intersex people that are sort of divine characters, right? Because they have both sides of the spectrum. So it's not like, these are not binary divisions. They are real, they're just poles in one relational force, right? So um, that's how they, they thought that, you know, what there is is a set of these binary relationships that struggle and work against each other called inamikwan, I-N-A. M A E N A M I K I can type that E N A M I K W A N H U A N is at the end there, um, and they what they end up doing is they end up being related to each other in various formats that we can kind of think of like an ecosystem, you know, like so the basic way to think about this is we all know the water cycle, right? Rains, 
hits the mountains, turns into a river, goes into the oceans, evaporates, goes up and becomes rain again. We get this little cycle, a cyclical process, okay? That's kind of how these Inamiquan relationships get, they get kind of mapped into each other to form these stabilizing cycles, right? And um, so that's, that was their expression. They say, okay, so Omitera exists first. Omitera itself expresses originally, according to their myths, as space-time, right? the four cardinal coordinates mapped in with temporal coordinates. And those then are the basic fundamental characters of our universe, but that's not enough because there are further enomic relationships that get mapped onto that, and they create kind of global constellations that uh, we might call an age, and they call the sun metaphorically. So we, our world is this big ecosystem of a certain sort, uh, and humans in previous ages, previous suns, lived differently, right? They had different basic sustenance and that sort of stuff. And there were four previous suns, or the fifth sun. Our sun is characterized by movement, that's what they called it, and they thought that it too would collapse like all the rest of them. The idea is that the ecosystem formation isn't, there's nothing inherently eternal about it. So they're very not Greek. Get an ecosystem, it kind of creates an equilibrium, exists for a while, but like all things, it kind of goes to naught. That's why we had a kind of existential imperative to make it survive as long as possible. Right? And that's where they thought that certain things like human blood would be useful for keeping the sun moving and that sort of stuff. That's where that gets involved. But um, they also thought that it would all come to naught. And uh, so those are their physical principles. And it really organized, you can see them trying to organize the world. The, the heart of keeping our sun alive is about order and organization, right? And I was going to show you some images here about what they did in their cities, because it's easiest to kind of start out with their cities. And then once you kind of see what they're doing, they're like, oh, okay. Then they did it in their poetry. And then you can see how they do the same thing in, in like your character. That's where it gets into ethics. So it's the same pattern that goes throughout all of this. All right, so a couple of images. Um, all right, well, what we can see here, and this is obviously, it's part of an essay, but um, what we can see here is an al tepet, which they call the city. It was already an organization of two things put together, water and mountain being put together, that's what an al tepet means. And you would have these little sub-regions of a city. I've organized them here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I know, it's wonderful art. Um, and this is idealized. The little squares here are the buildings, and uh, the other space is the surrounding land. The important thing to note about this is that the al tepet includes a lot of the surrounding lands. When the Spaniards would come in, they would see like this organization of buildings and think like, oh, that's the city here. No, the whole thing is the city. W what they had is buildings in various parts. And what they would do is each one of these subunits is called a, a big house, literally called poli. And they would um, shift the obligations of what each little neighborhood would have to do. Okay, that's what a called poli is. It's kind of like a larger neighborhood, ethnic group, whatever. And so, for example, unit one here would have to make all of the feathers for this year. And then unit two would have to make all of the meal corn. And unit three would have to make all of the warrior's clothes. And so they had obligations about what they had to do and they shifted those around according to their 260 day calendar. Um, and they're organized by group hierarchy. So unit one here is the top neighborhood. Like according to their own standards, which might be set by like who won the most battles recently or whatever else. And so the leader of this neighborhood is also then the leader of the city. Right? So if you're the leader of the top neighborhood, you become the, the leader of the city and hence you become a king. That's what the king was. Okay, it was just the top leader of the top neighborhood. All right, and so they would organize things. And so what I want you to see is that there is the basic view of the world is that these doubling units uh, bifurcate out like cells dividing. Originally, this would have started out maybe with just two units or something, right? And then those like cells, how cells divide, 
like they kind of divide in the middle and then they divide again and they divide again. That process of cellular division is how you get these units. So that's why they tend to be in these units of two, four, eight, that sort of thing, right? And that's why the universe is held to be this kind of like a flower that's growing by symmetrical patterns. And what is, what's doing the symmetry of the flow here is the rotation of obligations. Right. Ultimately, these cities would become larger cities. So this is Tlaxcala. And what you see here is one set. So like this whole thing, the Altepet, would become part of this complex Altepet. Right. So now we have that one here, and it, and it has a higher level of obligations. And those obligations rotate like this, north to south to east to west. Right, and then that's how they would organize it so that the city has those obligations. Here is Chalco. We don't, there's like some scholarly confusion about it, but it looks like they had a different rotational scheme. Here's Tenochtitlan, which became Mexico City, right? And you can see how it kind of moved its uh, obligations in the same structure. So the whole point here is that the cellular division gets symmetrically organized through obligations. And what you'll find is that this same principle here, that's more of this stuff, you will find it in their speech. So this is Tekpilatoli, which is noble speech. And the, they try to do this, what makes for artistic language is a doubling of terms. So they would say things like, in tokolhuan, in tachtonhuan, which means our grandfathers and great grandfathers, literally. But what they meant by that was their ancestors. These are called disfrasismos. So you make better speech in Nahuatl by doubling them. It's the same sort of pattern, right? The, uh, the exit, the patio, you say that for your household. The arrow and shield means a war. Mat and seat means authority. Jewel and feather, one's child, right? So they would use these expressions to express one term through doubling. And you get poetry that works this way too, right? This is a really big complex poem here, but ultimately they break down into these doubling pairs of stanzas. They don't have meter in verse, so they don't rhyme. Instead, they have three parts. One part here that is not um, shared, one part that is shared, and one part that is just uh, vocals that are meaningless. And you'll find that these last two parts are repeated. So that's what joins the verse pairs. And these two parts are different. And so that's the progression of the poem. And so each poem gets structured in this way, gets linked, and then you get those get joined together just like cities. So this is like an altepet and this is like a complex altepet. So you see the doubling patterns re-emerging there. All right. So and then the same thing finally happens with your character. Right? Your, your character is supposed to have two parts. Your psychology is your face and your heart, and you have to align those devils together. Right? Face being a metaphor for seat of judgment, heart being a metaphor for the seat of your desires. So you have to learn to align those things in various ways. So that is the basic idea of the Aztec universe is that we get these doubling pairs. That's what makes reality concrete. They get organized into various ways. How do we keep the harmony going? You keep it by having a symmetry of some sort. With cities, you get the symmetry by rotational orders. With poems, you get the symmetry through um, mirrored schemes, same terms. In a human being, you achieve a symmetry through virtue. Right? Same idea, all of those different places. And that's kind of their view of the world, right? Like, once you get that view, you're like, okay, that's what they're trying to do to stave off the collapse of the universe and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we get it. So that's where they're going with all of this stuff. And that's what it looks like. Um, I, yeah, so Aztec cosmology, really quickly, I, that's how I would put it together. That's really complicated, right. really complex, and really interesting. But it also turned into a really interesting uh, transition to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about the Aztec ethics, their, their view on what's right and what's wrong. Do you have something to offer here? Yeah, so, okay. So th then that turns into, okay, so 
you kind of get the idea of the, the world is this place that hopefully is beautiful, right? Um, that's their basic sense that even though our universe will collapse, there is value and beauty to be had in the struggle against entropy. That's really their view. We will all fail. That, that's not the point, right? Uh, which, you know, really brings us to kind of like lesson zero for Aztec ethics, which is that you're not after happiness. You just think you are, okay? Um, and the way I tell this to my students is like, okay, look, um, I'll give you a couple of thought experiments. There's a case in Homer's Odyssey where Homer makes like a really weird choice or Odysseus makes a weird choice. And it sounds like it's an Aztec choice. He's on this island with Calypso, who's a goddess. He wants to go home. He's been there for seven years and the gods take pity on him and they send Hermes, the messenger god, who tells Calypso, you gotta let him go. Calypso says, fine, on one condition that I get one last chance to convince him to stay. Okay, next scene, Odysseus is seated across from Calypso. Uh, she's drinking ambrosia, food for immortals. He's having ordinary mortal food. And she says, look, I'm going to offer you immortality and agelessness. If you want to stay on the island here with me, you'll never have to work. It's a beautiful romantic partner for the rest of his time. He will never age and he will never die. And Odysseus says, drinks his whatever drink and says, yeah, no, no, thank you. And he goes off and he builds a raft raft and heads home. He's like, I would rather die trying to visit my family than stay here forever. And so I asked my students like, well, okay, those stakes are a little high, right? But like, let's do it in this context. Uh, suppose that we'll do a little like version of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Suppose you find a magical wardrobe, right? And you go to the other side and it's this other world. And in this other world, you get to be a billionaire, right? You, you can find interesting romantic people over there. And it just turns out you will live forever and never, never age and never die. The only thing you got to do to secure your agelessness though is close the door from that other side. You can never see your friends or family again. You can't even see your dog. Right? They will never know what happened to you. You will just disappear. How many of you would close the door and never see them again? You're like, no, no, I would, I would give all that stuff up to see my friends and family and my dog again. Right. And so you're making the same choice as Odysseus. But you know, that first thing there, what you're being offered is pretty much happiness in the colloquial sense. Right. All of your needs are taken care of. All of these pleasures are taken care of. You'll never have to suffer what aging is. You'll live forever. Isn't that happiness? It's weird. Odysseus chooses to leave the Garden of Eden. He leaves paradise. He chooses to. He's not expelled. Um, and we would all make the same choice. Right. And so the point there is that and the, the way the Aztecs talk about it very straightforwardly is they say, look, pleasure, happiness in that sense, it comes and goes. We all kind of recognize the elevated emotional states, they come and they go. Uh, yeah, you can affect them a little bit, but that's not really the goal of our lives. Most of us would choose, given the option, most of us would choose against having lots of elevated emotional states and would rather choose our relationships that we find meaningful with our friends and family and so forth. That's, what, that's the choice we make over and over again. It's why when I present my students with the evidence for like having kids, right, there's a lot of overwhelming evidence that having children makes you less happy. You have lower levels of those positive emotional states until the last child leaves your house. And we have like four longitudinal studies on this that showed the exact same thing. It's just a fact and parents deny it. The children and students in my class, they, they haven't had children. So they're, they have no vested interest in this. They, they can agree to it, right? Um, the Aztec point would be, look, you have children because that's worthwhile, it's worth doing, not because it makes you happy. As a matter of fact, Americans are deluded by this idea that the only worthwhile things are the things that make you happy. There are many other things that make you happy. As a matter of fact, happiness and the sense of elevated emotional states just doesn't matter to most of us that much. You just think you're after happiness, you're not really. 
So then what are you after? Well, a better way to talk about that rather than meaningfulness or something like that, the way the Aztecs would talk about it, is they would say you're after a rooted life. Okay. Rootedness. So what you want to do is you want to live a life where you don't slip up on the earth so much, right? where you don't make mistakes. For them, your journey into, there are like four stages of your journey into ethics. Um, so Buddhism, for example, begin, begins when you recognize that you, the life is suffering or something like that. The Aztecs would say, your ethical journey begins when uh, you slip up. When you fail, you meet some kind of disappointment in life. Um, I remember reading an interview about uh, Trent Reznor, who was, a, for those of you who don't know, was in like a 1990s uh, rock band dude, okay? He was the lead singer of Nine Inch Nails and got everything he ever wanted by the age of 26. And he was interviewed um, by Spin Magazine when people read magazines. And they said, like, so what was the experience like? And so it was, you know, his reply was, well, what if you got everything you ever wanted and it still sucked, right? That is the point at which Aztec ethics begins, right? You run into, you slip up. It's you know, like you either make a mistake or you experience disillusionment. You, you think you wanted something, you get there and it doesn't make you happy. Okay, that is where you realize, okay, I need something else. The reason you slip up, the Aztecs say, is because you come into the world unbalanced. Your face and heart are not naturally aligned. Matter of fact, they say you don't really have a face. You don't have any judgment as an infant, okay? You have to grow judgment over time. And so we have a wonderful passage of a father talking to his infant son, saying, you're like a little bird right now. Someday you will grow a face. And it sounds really weird, right? But by, by that, what he means is someday you will have judgment in your life. Right now, you're just this bundle of desires, undirected emotions going like everywhere. It's where you have a heart that are not consistent. Growing up is a matter of organizing those desires in a consistent, coherent way, developing judgment, developing a face, right? And the description of the philosopher that we have is exactly that person in society that you go to when you have these problems and they help you a little bit like Socrates, they help you align your face and your heart. That's, the, that's their job. Um, so you have to learn to get balance in life. That, that's the goal. You, you slip up because you're unbalanced. The solution is to gain balance. And gaining balance is one of the me many metaphors that they use for rootedness. And that's why I have some of these trees here. Um, they have these images of huge trees because they describe in some of these passages uh, the ideal person as a person who looks like the uh, Montezuma cypress and the uh, Siva tree. So here we go, some images. For the... So um, here you have, so th this is, this is a statement recorded in the Florentine Codex, that's volume six, page, uh, chapter 14, page 67, in the standard Dibble, Dibble and Anderson edition. So uh, it's, this is talking about an ideal man, but it's the same image for the ideal woman. He is revered in truth. He is known as a sustainer. He becomes the great sea bud, the Montezuma Cypress, next to him beside which people take refuge. So here's the Siba tree, and you can see that it's got enormous roots. These are two different trees, but it's got enormous roots here, right? And here's the Montezuma cypress, the Aquacuete. This is just one large tree the size of a block. Here it is zoomed out next to a church, right? And the idea for both of them is that, you know, people can take refuge there. And this is the sort of person who has these large roots, won't slip up, and they can guide our lives, right? So the idea then for the Aztecs is uh, you gain balance, aligning your face and heart and that means you take root at three different levels in your body because they didn't they thought that you actually had to physically exercise and do stuff in your body they had like a, a thing that is like yoga right uh, that's pretty it is it's very much like yoga aztec yoga or something like that we have people who are seated in lotus positions and little figurines so we know that it was very much like yoga you got to do take care of your body and then you have to align your face and heart take care of your psyche and then you have to but you also have to do that in relationship to other people in the world, so in society. And so society though for them included the natural environment, it was very broadly conceived. So uh, three different levels, body, psyche, society. And if you do that, you lead a rooted life, which is a kind of meaningful and integrated life.
which is a better version of what we're after than happiness. Okay, that's a really super interesting and I want to ask more about it, but for the sake of time, mm -hmm. my last question will be asking you to help me understand all these ideas, all these complex ideas, where did they get them from? How did they justify it? How did they say they knew that this is the way it is and how it ought to be and what we should do, et cetera? All right, yeah, so, and it's, it's a really useful question for uh, doing anything ethically, right? Uh, they held what might be called a best account view, basically, as epistemologists. It's not quite a coherentist account, but, Okay, so they would say, you take the view that you have on offer. And the reason we know this is because there was actually a dialogue between the uh, Spaniards, Spanish priests and the Tlamatinime just after the conquest in 1524. And we actually know the woman who would have recorded it or would have done the translating had to be Malinche because she was the only person in the world with those capabilities. So there's this really weird way in which the first recorded Aztec philosopher that we have is a woman right? But she's silently eroded in this thing because she's actually just translating between the two. Uh, she was also the woman that Cortez used to uh, translate for all of his goals too. This is a really complicated issue here. But um, in, this, in these colloquies, we understand kind of how they reasoned. And basically what the Tlamatini say in response to the Christian views is that, look, all right, there are three ways that we think about uh, what's right. One of them is that it makes sense with what we understand about the natural environment. So kind of like coherence with whatever they understand there. Another one is that it, we have some reputable opinions. They say it comes from what is written in red and black ink. So these are reputable and tested opinions over time. It's not that they can't be updated, but that, you know, like centuries of our, our ancestors have thought these were good principles. We've tested them. And if we're going to overturn one of these tested principles, we need good reasons. And then the third thing that we have is common sense, right? informed common sense about these topics. And so they kind of use all three of these data, their understanding of the natural environment, their understanding of informed, like, reputable points of view, and their understanding of informed common sense, and you triangulate them when you're thinking about topics. Mm. And you can override any of those. You just need good reasons. And what effectively, they say to the Spaniards is, we don't see, we don't have any good reasons in what you've presented us to override these things. It doesn't make sense to us. This weird God, man thing, save us from hell that we don't really understand. Like, just didn't make any sense to them at all. You're talking gibberish. I don't know why we'd want to believe in all of that. Um, and I know you're going to be very angry at us for not believing in it, but we just don't understand like where it sits in this. So that's how they justified things morally. It's a best account. So if you want to come up with a different account, you can like just like show them and then you go kind of go forward. But you know, it's this sort of like defeasibilist view of, of ethics. I think that you know we hold these views until something better comes along and, and then we just update. That's kind of how they thought about it. 